Welcome everyone to the January meetup for the Microsoft Cloud Security User Group. We're with myself and Chris today, and we've got Christian Decker with us. So Hi. it's great to have you all on board. It's obviously the first one of the year for us. So um, yeah, looking forward to kind of having kickstarting 2023 with a good user user group session. Um, start off with our code of conduct. So the key points here is really that the user group is designed to be a fun, safe place for everyone to learn, grow within the area of Microsoft Cloud security. Um, we actively encourage an inclusive and diverse community. And we are a diverse tech community where we are all individuals with differences, but we're all members and we all learn from each other. Um, and with that, we expect every member of the group to respect each other, whether they are attending or presenting at our group. So just want to make it as friendly as possible and open as possible for everyone, really, um, to increase knowledge around cloud security. Chris? Yeah, evening, guys. So um, I'm Chris Wright. Um, I th those of you who don't know me. Um, so there is ways to interact with us um, many of you will probably come across us via the social medias on LinkedIn and Twitter. Uh, you've probably seen our posts going out the, the, the last couple of weeks um, around tonight's event. Um, but we're also looking at additional content that we can push out for that for, for, for knowledge share and, and help to, to grow this community. Uh, we've also got our YouTube as well um, where we'll put the recording up of tonight's session um, and that'll be available for for you guys to, to to look back on if you need to or share it around to to anyone um to, to share the, the relevant information and the presentation from Christian tonight. So just a little bit about myself and Chris. So I'm Charlie Goff. I'm a senior cloud security architect for Open Systems. Um I use kind of the Twitter handle get off me land. I'm based down in Somerset. So you can probably see where that comes from. Um, obviously, key area for me is cloud security. I do it day in, day out. I try to at least when not attending meetings. Um, but yeah, kind of looking to grow that area of cloud security because it's so important at the moment. We've got a massive shortfall in the industry of, well, people within that within that sector of IT. Chris? Yes, yeah, so I'm Chris Wright. Um, if those of you who can guess, I'm from Liverpool. I work for a company called HCG, um, based up in just outside of Newcastle, South Shields. Uh, also want to give a shout out to them for sponsoring this user group. And they sponsored us last year and continuing to, to sponsor us through this year. Um, Azure is my main area of focus, but I do like um, M365, all cloud technologies, and um, but I always have this strong pull of security, and I really enjoy the security aspect. Constantly want to learn and and grow myself within the security arena. Um, and yeah, that was why we started this group in the first place, Charlie. Um, for sharing that knowledge, and and as Charlie said, the the, the, the there is a big area of growth within cloud security. Um, so that's me. And uh, free to reach out to me as well on LinkedIn and Twitter. So we're joined today with Christian Decker um, for his session really on on conditional access to good, the bad and the ugly. Um, after kind of Christians, we'll have a Q&A available. So obviously ask questions in the chat and we can try and pull those up at relevant points. And then at the end, obviously, be open session for Q&A and then we usually have a quiz. We've not done one this um, this month, just purely from a time perspective. So after obviously Christian se um, session, we'll be just doing some general networking and really a open floor for a conversation more than anything. So with that hand over to Christian. Thank you very much. And you do not have to wait until the end for your questions. If you have questions, please raise your hand uh, or put it in the chat and you can ask your questions every time. So thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, 
I will speak about conditional access, one of the top topics uh, in my uh, work and in my Microsoft uh, uh, knowledge. And I will talk a little bit of the good of conditional access, a little bit of the bad and about the very ugly part in conditional access. Some words about me. I'm a cloud architect at ACP. It's a partner in, in Austria, one of the best and probably the, the best partners. Uh, I worked nine years as a PTA partner technology uh, advisor at Microsoft in Austria. This was very helpful to understand why Microsoft built Office 365 in the way they built it. So if you understand how Microsoft works internally, you understand why Teams and, and so on works as it's designed. Uh, I have a blog, it's derdecker.at. Sorry, it's in German, but you can use Google Translate. It's full of practical tips about Office 365, Teams, security for admins, for users. Just take a look. I have deep knowledge in Office 365, Teams, Azure Active Directory, and conditional access. I do about two to three conditional access projects in a month. So uh, it's a lot and a lot of discussions with customers. And my hobbies. I'm the CEO, so the chief entertainment officer um, for the WIP area at the greatest and, and largest one day and hardest one day uh, enduro uh, event. It's the Erzberg Rodeo. So if you look at Paris Dakar, Paris Dakar is nice and long. Uh, Erzberg Rodeo is even harder. Um, so 500 people start on Sunday, and most of the times only 10 uh, reach the finish line. So it's really hard. I'm the moderator of a LinkedIn group about conditional access. So uh, there you will find all news and, and interesting posts about conditional access. Uh, there you can post questions and, and so on. This is the link, so you can follow it. So I will start with a brief overview of conditional access. It's really brief because I think most of you will know what conditional access is and um, how you license it. But if there are someone who never heard about conditional access, I will start with this brief overview. Then I will talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. And most of the time I will talk about the best practices and learnings we did in the last two, three years. We have a group of, of cloud architects. We have a lot of discussions about uh, the learnings in, in customer projects. And we have built a standard for our uh, conditional access implementations. So everyone at ACP does conditional access in the same way. And we discuss the standard in, in, in monthly meetings and we change it and we, we make it even better. And I will share today um, the learnings. What is conditional access? Um, it controls access to the Microsoft 365 tenant. You have several uh, signals where you can build rules. So signals like which user access the cloud, which role does the user have, uh, on which device does the user uh, work, from which location does he work, which application does he try to access, and the risk, and a little bit more. And based on these signals, you can build rules where you say, OK, access is allowed to conditional access, you can say you need a second factor for the access to conditional access, or you can say I block conditional access. Uh, I, I block the access. The objectives of conditional access are clear. Uh, conditional access protects the user identity and conditional access protects the company data. 
which license do you need? You need uh, AT Premium P1 as a baseline. Um, you, in reality, you need Intune also because only with Intune you can control access from mobile devices. Uh, and AD Premium P1 and Intune is included in Microsoft 365 Business Premium in the Enterprise Mobility and Security Suite E3 and E5 in the Microsoft 365 E3 and E5 and in Microsoft 365 F3 and F5. And maybe there are other packages where it's included. Uh, in my experience, most of the customers have at least 80 premium P1 because you cannot really secure and govern a tenant without 80 premium P1. So you need at least 80 premium P1. Now we come to the good, the bad, and the ugly. The part on conditional access I love it most is if you build a security solution, there is always the problem that every security um, lowers productivity or most of the security solutions lowers productivity. And if you create a very secure environment, um, then your users will try to use other solutions and not your solutions because they are not able to work. I've seen a lot of very interesting um, ways from the users to overcome the security in the in the company. Um, and the, the really good security expert is this expert that can balance security and productivity. So it's not always the secure system, the, the most secure system, the most secure environment. But if you if your users are able to work to do their job and you have a secure system, this is the goal. And conditional access gives us the possibility to create very secure environments with low or no um, uh, uh, problems with productivity. You can make good basic rules so you can create a baseline and it's very easy to say I have some accounts, for example, uh, uh, service accounts that have less security than the rest, than the baseline. And it's easy to say I have some accounts, some roles, some situations where you need more security. And it's very easy to make exceptions for applications, for groups, for some devices. So you are able to fulfill nearly every business need and every security need uh, with conditional access. The bad thing. Um, we never ask the customer what he will do with conditional access, because in most times the customer says, oh, um, let's do MFA if the people are outside of the company network. And this is the old thinking, the old thinking, this is the, the picture of my, my home city. I'm from Vienna, from Austria. And in the older days, we have a wall around Vienna to secure the city. Uh, and in, in 6083, the Ottoman empires besieged uh, Vienna for about two months, and it was impossible for them to overcome the city walls. So it was secure inside, it was unsecure outside. Um, and from this time, the idea comes, I have a good firewall, so inside is secure, outside is unsecure. But in 1683, this time, type of defense almost failed, even in this time. So it's about 400, uh, more than 400 years. Because the Ottomans dug a tunnel under the, the wall and um, tried to, to get into the city from under the wall. But 
in Vienna, we had the first intrusion detection system. So we invented it uh, because the Vienna people sat in their cellars and drink wine and they put the, their glasses on the wine bottles uh, and see the vibrations of the Ottomans where they're working and building, digging the tunnel. And so they know, OK, there comes the enemy and they were able to defeat the enemies. So if you want to know who defended the first intrusion detection system, it was the Vienna people. And you see that the idea that inside it's secure and outside it's unsecure uh, didn't work in the past and will not work today. The second bad thing about conditional access is not really conditional access, but it's the MFA activation. We see that in most companies, not every user has a company cell phone. And most of the users have a problem to use their private phone for business reasons. So they say, no, I don't want to install an, an, any business app like the Authenticator on my private phone. I don't want to publish my private phone number to the company and so on and so on. And we see if we uh, deploy MFA to the users, uh, there are always five to 10% of users that are not able to do the registration. It's easy, I think for most of you, it's, it's really easy, but we always have five to 10% of users that are not able to do this registration. And MFA is better than no MFA, but MFA is not uh, secure. There are some uh, methods to steal the, the token from, from MFA. Uh, I put the link in the slide deck. So it's better to have MFA than no MFA, but MFA, uh, that the normal MFA is not the real secure uh, method. And MFA is not funny. Believe me, I have 10 to 20 customers where I have accounts in and I have to do MFA every time. And no, it's not fun. And the ugly part, I will come back to this later so that you stay in my presentation waiting for the ugly part of conditional access. Now I will start with some best practices uh, for the implementation of conditional access. There are four steps. The first step is you have to plan the rules. Then you have to create the prerequisites. You need to implement the rules. Then you have to create and document the rules. And the last point is troubleshooting if you need it. We use this Excel for planning the rules. So I always do two sessions with the customer. The first session is together with the security guy, um, uh, the GDPR guy, um, the worker council guy and sometimes. So in the first session, I do not really need the high technical guys, but we set together and define the rules on an organizational base. So we talk about user personas, uh, we talk about platforms and we talk about guests and so on. And we define this type of users need for this type of devices, this rules or this um, second factors, or we block the, the um, access to the network. So we made really good experience to use this type to create together um, the rules. And as I said, we do not ask the customer what rules do you want, because most of the customers have never implemented conditional access, so they have no idea what conditional access is able to do. We always come with our best practices, we discuss the best practices with the customers, adapt the best practices to the 
needs of the customer and um, go with that. The first best practice is the glass break admin. It's a cloud only account. Um, we exclude this glass break admin from all other rules. Uh, Microsoft recommend two glass break admins. And we discussed this a lot. And I don't like the idea to have two accounts with global admin rights that are not protected by a second factor. So we always implement only one glass break admin. Uh, if you have an idea why you need two glass break admin accounts, share it with me in the chat or talk to me. We always include only one account. We create the password of the glass break admin, 20, 25 uh, uh, characters. And um, it's very important not to store the password of the Glassback admin in any key pass or other password uh, systems. Um, we create that the process is normally we create uh, the password, we check the letters in the password if there is a small L or a capital I. Uh, so hard letters that are hard to read. And we put it in Notepad, we create the user, we put the password to the user, we make a test login with this user, and then we print the Notepad on, an, uh, on a printer and delete the Notepad without saving it. Uh, this is the only safe way. Um, be careful, the password from the Glassback admin should not expire. Um, and then we take the, the password, put it in an envelope, seal it, and put it uh, in a safe place. Uh, but be aware, the IT should have access to this safe place. And um, we regular log in with this um, Glassback admin, so four times or two times a year. Um, we we take out the envelope, make a login, change the password, print it out, put it in the envelope, and um, put it back in the safe place. The best practice is also that every login with the Glassback admin must trigger an alarm, because no one should use this user, so uh, no one should log on with this. So if someone logs on with a Glassback admin, um, it is a bad guy. So our best practice for users, um, for, for normal. Yes, uh, the, the question is, uh, would I make the Glassback admin for a global admin? Definitive, yes. The Glassback admin is a global admin. I forgot to mention this because it's so clear for me. My recommendation is never start with conditional access without a Glassback admin. It's so easy to create the rule that blocks all access to the, to the um, tenant. Um, it's really easy. Uh, a colleague of mine with the same experience in conditional access um, it was a near miss, so he nearly pressed save on the rule, and then he said, oh, let me check, and then he found out that with this rule, he would block all access. So every time, create the class back up. For the users, I told you that we see that the registration of MFA is often difficult and cause problems. And I do not like problems in my projects. I do like smooth projects without any user problems. So we discussed the point, how can we avoid this MFA registration? How can we avoid the need of a company phone? And we go back and we think about what is the idea of MFA? And MFA, the idea of a multi-factor authentication is something I know, my password, 
and something I have. That's the idea of MFA, of a two-factor authentication. So the idea is if I tell you my password, you're not able to log in because you do not have something I have. And most of the people think on the term MFA that you need an SMS, an authenticator, an RSA token or something else. But the company device is also a valid second factor. So we use the company device, the company managed device as the second factor for the normal users. That has two advantages. The first advantage is that you secure the identity of the user. The second advantage is that you also secure the data of the company, because if you only allow access from company devices, you make sure that the company data is not stored on unsecure devices. Sometimes in very rare situations, we use the network as a second factor. I have one customer that had, has a network access control and an always on VPN. And with these customers, we, we say for the Windows devices um, that we uh, use the network and not the, the hybrid Azure they joined. The question was, so we do not allow bring your own devices. Yes and no. For example, this is my private phone. I bought a Google Pixel 7 because I, I think I, I need one. So yes, this is bring your own device, but this device is company managed. So there is Intune. I have a company container. My company sees only the applications inside the container. Outside the container, it's my phone. I can do everything. My IT, my company does not see what I do outside the container and the company controls the container. So yes, we allow bring your own device if the device is company managed. Because we, we will not allow company data synchronized to devices that are not protected and managed by the company. Did I answer your question? Yes, that's that's the uh, good thing on containers. Um, I can uh, delete the container. I can wipe the container as a company and not the private data. Uh, I will come to mobile application management in two minutes, five minutes, maybe. Um, the good point of using the company device as a second factor is that the user will not recognize that he's protected by a second factor because the user can work with his company devices as before. He will only recognize it if he try to access the company, also the tenant, with a uh, uh, private uh, device. You need no training, um, no company cell phone, just your company devices. For admins, we say you need your password. You need a company device. In most cases, we say you need a Windows device, we do not allow access from a mobile device for administrators. And you need a strong authentication with a FIDO2 uh, key. So uh, I have this, it's from Fightian, it's in USB and NFC FIDO key, and I really like it. I have protected all of my accounts with this because you do not need to plug it in. You push a button, it makes a USB connection. You uh, put in your, your pin and you, you're safe. And in conditional access, we are able to uh, uh, force an administrator to use the FIDO2 authentication. 
we do not create the rule for people that have administrative rights. Uh, we select all the roles that are uh, available in uh, Office 365. So it's about 88 roles. If you do this, always deselect the directory synchronization account role um, because the directory synchronization account role is only available for the account that makes the AD connect. Um, you cannot add this role to a normal user. And if you save the uh, directory synchronization account with a second factor, AD Connect will not work any longer, and you will recognize this normally two, three days after implementing um, conditional access. I will not say that we did this in the beginning of our implementations. Uh, the question was, do we have uh, Linux and macOS? Yes, uh, macOS you can protect also with Intium. Uh, if you have users that use Linux, you cannot. Um, uh, if it's Ubuntu, you can add it to, to Intune also. If it's uh, another Linux um, uh, version, you cannot secure the access. So we create a group normally where we say Linux users and um, we allow for these users access from a Linux device with normal multi-factor authentication. That's the good thing, we can do exceptions. Uh, if you have uh, external admins, so admins that are that do not have a, a company device. I have an admin account at some customers. You need a group for this external admins. You exclude the, this group in the in the admin rule and uh, force these admins only for MFA with FIDO2 and not to use a company device. Uh, Android phones and iPhones, yes, it's the same. Um, and we do a sign-in frequency for 10 hours, so we force an administrator to log on every day. If we work longer than 10 hours, you can do it to 12 hours. Then we have some exceptions. Um, we Sometimes we make a group of service accounts that are all users that cannot do a second factor, so team room devices, for example. Um, here we use the network as a second factor, the trusted network, and we try to manage team room devices also with Intune. Uh, you have to restrict MFA and Intune registration. I I miss up. Uh, I, I miss the Intune registration here. Um, to the local network, because if um, if you can re register a device from anywhere in the world, then an attacker that knows your password can register his device to Intune with the password, and um, then he can access your network with your credentials. So always allow MFA registration registration and Intune registration uh, from the local internal network. Uh, the in ah, I so uh, I will come, I will finish the, the, the slide deck and then I will uh, look at the questions. Um, we we create a group for the Intune enrollment. I, I have it on the slide deck, sorry, um, and put it in the exceptions because if a user is outside of the company uh, in another country and lost his phone, he can go to the next store, buy a phone, and then you must be able to enable the Intune registration for this user. So you put it in the group, he's able to re register Intune, and then you um, put in. Away. So, 
let me look at the questions. Uh, the class break admin, bring your own device. Uh, mobile application management we will talk about. I answered the question about Linux and Mac devices. Um, yeah, if you have backup accounts, um, then you need to exclude the backup account from the from the um, admin role. Uh, if the backup account connects from an offline network, uh, if the network is offline, he cannot connect to the cloud. And I'm not sure what a jump box is. Uh, Stuart, can you explain it a little bit more, your question? And do you manage multiple users using a service account? Uh, Jamil, what do you mean with that? Um, a service account is a, an account that is used by scripts, by PowerShell scripts or similar uh, actions. A service account is not an account that manage, um, that is used by a, a, a real people. If if a real people use an account, you need always a personal account. Would you request some guests to enroll devices and check for compliance if they're licensed for Intune? Uh, you, if you want guests, if you want to force guests to use compliant devices, you have to, in, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I think you cannot, it, it does not work with guests, um, but if you want to allow external people, so people outside of your um, tenant, to access only with compliant devices, you have to use B2B Connect, um, make a B2B connection with the other tenant where you trust the devices from the B2B connection, and then you can use conditional access to create the rule B2B connection with this tenant, and there you can say you need a managed or compliant device. So this does not work for tests, but it works for B2B Connect. Uh, admin box that allows you link to access. Ah, you, you mean, Stuart, you mean a privileged uh, access workstation. Yeah, if you use a privileged access workstation or something else, then it's recommended that, that this workstation has a dedicated public IP address, and um, then you can restrict access for admins only from this dedicated public IP address. Did I answer the question? I like it if you if I get so many questions. You're a very good uh, uh, audience. Thank you very much. It's normally in this user group sessions, you talk and talk and you're not sure if the people are sleeping or if the network connection is down. So thank you for these questions. I, I appreciate this. Uh, we always do a, a block legacy authentication rule. Um, we discuss if we need it still, but um, if legacy authentication is disabled in your tenant, then this rule will not hurt anyone. So we build the, the, the block legacy authentication always. Now we have created the rules, we have planned the rules. Uh, in the next step, we have to create the prerequisites to implement the rules. At first, you have to check if your devices are recognized as Hybrid Asia D joint or as Intune compliant. If you want to use the status of an Hybrid Asia D joint device, um, that is for Windows devices, 
that are part of your Active Directory domain. Microsoft um, has the idea that every device that is part of your Active Directory is managed by you and is compliant. You have to sync the devices with AD Connect. That's not in the standard, so uh, you have to do this. And that a device gets the status of hybrid HRD, you have to sync it, and then the device must be connected to your local AD and to the uh, Asia ID. This was in Corona times a problem. We did a rollout um, at a customer. We synchronized the devices and we wondered that the devices didn't get the status of the hybrid Asia ID. And then we see that most of the users are in home office. They didn't have a VPN connection. They connect only um, via a, a remote desktop server. And so we were not able to get the hybrid HRD joint uh, status because the devices are not part of the, or didn't reach the, the uh, domain controller. The question is, um, what if ORC is locked down or off network, uh, ransomware or something else? Um, you need only one time this connection um, with your local AD and then your hybrid Asia AD. Then the connection to your local AD is not longer uh, uh, necessary. So for example, my um, PC, I'm once a week, two times a month in the company network. Um, the rest of the time I'm off the company and it's, it's no problem. So if your local infrastructure is down, you can still work with your hybrid HRD joint devices. If you use the alternate ID to make an AD connect, uh, so if your UPN of your local AD is not rootable and you use the alternate ID to sync your users, you need Active Directory Federation services um, to uh, detect an hybrid Azure D joint device. So if you use an alternate ID, you have to implement ADFS. For the detection in the browser of the PC, you have to do uh, some configurations. If you use the Edge browser, which I recommend, someone has to be logged in in the profile. So if your users are not logged in in the profile, um, Edge will not tell condition and access that the computer um, on which Edge is running is hybrid HRD joint. It must not be the same user. Anyone can be logged in in Edge browser, but if no one is logged in in the Edge profile, uh, condition access cannot detect um, the status of the computer. If you have Chrome as a browser, you have to install the Windows account extension. Uh, only with the Windows account extension, uh, Chrome will tell conditional access that this computer is hybrid HRD joint. And if you use Firefox, you need to enable Windows single sign on. It's in the options. And we found that if you disable the history in Firefox, um, the detection also does not work, so you have to uh, not to disable the history. If you do an in-private browsing, conditional access cannot recognize the status of your computer. So these are some uh, points you, you need to uh, remember. And then there is the questions, do I need Intune? For an, um, does it need to be using a proxy as well? No, you do not need a proxy for this, this detection. That that does uh, that is um, not necessary. It works with a proxy, but it does not need a proxy. Uh, if you have another mobile device management uh, system. Uh, can you detect 
the compliance status of um, Android and iOS? The answer is yes and no. So you need an Intune license to detect the compliance status of your Android and iOS devices. You do not need Intune as MDM. If you need one of these MDM systems, you can connect these MDM systems with Intune. That's very easy. The hardest part, hardest part of this is to find the documentation of the MDM system. So this is really the most complicated part. If you find the documentation in um, Workspace ONE or Mobile iHome, then it's re really easy to make the connection between, for example, Mobile iHome and Intune. And then Mobile iHome pushes the compliance status of your mobile devices to Intune and you can use it in conditional access. So if you use one of these MDMs, you need an Intune license, but you do not need Intune as an MDM. If you have another MDM or if you have to bring your own um, device scenario, then you can protect your data on Android and, I and iOS with um, mobile application management. You can do most of the rules you can do in an MDM to protect the data in uh, a uh, mobile application management rule. So you can say you need a, um, a PIN code, you need a, a um, secure device, this, the, the operating system, um, does not have to be uh, uh, rooted and so on. You need at least this operating system version. And you can say it's not allowed to copy data from a mobile application management secured application to an application that is not secured by mobile application management. If you to decide to protect your um, Android and iOS devices with MEM policies, you need a second factor for these users. So for these users, you need MFA um, with the authenticator or uh, with an SMS. Because with mobile application management, you can only protect data and not the identity. Uh, yes, you need the Intune license for each user. Bring your own devices. Will they need to be enrolled and managed or just an account? Um, if you use mobile application management, you do not need to enroll the device. Um, if you log in from any Android or iOS device, um, for example, to the team application and mobile application management policies are enforced, then this policy works perfect. The fun thing is if you log out from your phone, from, from, from the Teams client and log, uh, make a login to another tenant that is not protected from uh, mobile application management policies, you can do anything. And then you log out again, log into your tenant that is protected, then the app is protected. So this is really a, a really good um, uh, protection. Be careful, mobile application management does not work for Windows. So there is no way to protect company data on a Windows device or a Mac OS device with mobile application management. The only way to protect data here is um, with Intune or with um, a compatible uh, uh, MDM. Uh, you need the, the license for Intune. You can buy Intune as a standalone product. Uh, Intune is included in um, business, uh, Microsoft 365 Business Premium, and Intune is included in the Microsoft 365 E3 
and E5, uh, and in the Enterprise Mobility and Security Suite. Um, there is uh, uh, Intune included. You do not need the E5. E3 is good enough. So this is a rule we discussed, discussed a lot, um, and we decided to to create this rule at every customers. So we create a list of allowed um, countries and we select all the classical um, uh, holiday countries here. So, so Germany and, and Italy and Greece and Egypt and US and, and so on. And we allow access to conditions uh, to your tenant only from these um, countries. We uh, do it only with IP4. So if you select this um, and you do not include unknown uh, countries, access with IP6 is not possible. We have only a, a few customers um, that have a problem with this because their uh, mobile provider um, uh, uses IP6 to, to um, uh, make the connection, uh, then you have to disable this, this rule. It's, to be honest, it protects you only for, from automated hackers. Uh, if a hacker wants to access your network, this rule will not uh, block him because he will use a VPN and come from an allowed uh, country. So, after you created the prerequisites for corporate devices, uh, my recommendation is that you go to your um, Asia ED, go to the sign-in logs of the users and download this sign-in logs to a uh, CSV because then you can check your rules on your um, uh, real logins of your users. So you can check is every device my, my users log in managed and or compliant. And do not implement your rules until most of the logins of your users are uh, compliant and managed. The next part is go to the old multi-factor um, um, uh, session and start with um, the users and check if there are any users enforced in the old MFA portal. And if you have users uh, enforced here, um, delete this enforcement after you created the policies because um, it will cause problems in, in troubleshooting if you enforce the user in the old portal and you have conditional access because no one will look here um, for, the, for the settings. The next point is go to the service settings and in the service settings, this allow the creation of app passwords. No one needs app passwords anymore. You need the app passwords only for legacy authentication. Do not use any trusted IPs here. Do this all only in uh, conditional access. And here you can check the methods you allow for multi-factor authentication. So text message, uh, the notification and the verification um, code from the mobile app. Let's next go to, to Asia AD security authentication methods. Um, go to the Microsoft Authenticator settings and go to configure um, and change all settings from Microsoft Manage. This is the default to enabled. Uh, what does this change? If you enable this, your multi-factor authentication um, screen will look like this. You see the application from which 
the logon is started, you see the location from which the user logs on, uh, the user see the location, and the authenticator will show you a two-digit number that you have put in here. Um, that uh, helps against attacks where the uh, attacker um, logs in and pushes multi-factor authentications to your phone uh, until you say, ah, okay, I will accept it. Uh, Microsoft will do this change in nearly a month, in two weeks, two, three weeks. Now it's it's a month, it's, it's end of February. So do it now um, because otherwise Microsoft will change this and your users will ask what, what this setting is. Uh, I've heard that continuous access evaluation does not work well with uh, uh, counter caps, but only with IP. Um, I have no experience with any problems with continuous access evaluation. So, uh, Pietro, sorry, I, I never had problems with this. Um, Stuart, what does not work with an uh, RDP gateway service? The recognition of, of countries? Yeah, uh, David, thank you for, for this. Um, you have to, to tell your users that the location in this map is not must not really be the the real location uh, because in in 4g it's sometimes somewhere else in the country um, uh, if you turned it off microsoft will turn it on uh, now you can disable it yes but in our setup a user will never get this setup also this screen this is only for admins, and the admin uh, does normally know this. Yeah, um, uh, the, the location is not really a protection. We, we know this. This was one of the reasons why we discussed it to enable it, don't enable it. Um, We do it as an additional protection, and uh, yes, uh, my colleague says you do not need the country rule because you need a company device to log in, and so the country rule will never happen. Um, yes, but so how do you do the rollout? The problem is. You do not want enable condition access on one day for all of your users. That will work for a small number of users, but it will not work if you have 1,000, 2,000 and more users. The staged rollout is difficult, and it's also difficult to create a group for users that are um, at, uh, uh, affected from conditional access because it, you have to change the rule if you roll it out to every user. Our solution is we create a cloud-only group and we include all users to this cloud-only group and we exclude this cloud-only group from every rule in conditional access because then you can create the rules as they are designed, and you can activate the rules because all users are in the in the exception group, so no one is affected by conditional access. The goal is that you have to empty this group in a short time frame. Um, I will show you in the next uh, 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 slide the PowerShell commands to create this group. And if you 
uh, create the rules, always be careful. Um, the current user is excluded by default. So always check before you say save that you change this from exclude the current user to I understand that my account will be impacted. This is the PowerShell script to create this group in Azure Active Directory. Why do we create it in Azure Active Directory and not in on-premise active uh, in on-prem AD? There are two reasons. First reason is if you create it in Azure Active Directory, you can include all cloud-only users also. And the second uh, point is if you do any changes, uh, if you remove users from this group, you have always, always wait for the next uh, synchronization cycle. And if there's any problem and you put the user back, you have always wait for the next synchronization cycle. So this is a cloud only group. So if you remove a user, conditional access will work for this user. If there's any problem, you put him back into the group and it will not work. If you create the rules, uh, best practice is to number the rules. Um, technically, it makes no sense. Um, it it uh, the, the rule the, the um, number of rule does not affect the effectiveness of the rule, but it helps in troubleshooting because then you can say, oh, my rule number four has a problem, and it's easier for this. We do not use complicated naming rules for the rules. Uh, I have seen some recommendations to put the content of the rule to the name. Um, I'm not sure if you change the name when you uh, adopt the rule, so we, we use a, a short uh, name. And now we come to the ugly thing you all have waited for. The user interface of conditional access is bullshit. There is no way to have an overview over the rules in the uh, GUI of conditional access. That's the reason why a lot of people put the content of the rule to the name to have the overview here in this in this thing. But I don't think this really works. We use an Excel sheet, and after I have created the rules, I take this Excel sheet and I document every single rule in this. Excel sheet. Uh, we have the name of the rule. We have, so my, my Excel is in German, so uh, I will explain it. You have the name, you have the user, the users they are included, and the users they are excluded. We use different colors for the groups we exclude because one check is every group that is excluded must be included in another rule. We have the apps that are included and excluded, the device platform that is included and excluded, the um, location and the client apps and the device filter and the grant and the session. And um, with this Excel, you have the overview over the rule and you are able to find holes in your conditional access policy. It's very important that you um, put every change of the rule back into the documentation. So this is one of the few things where we always have the actual documentation of the rules because here you have the overview over the rules. Troubleshooting. For troubleshooting, you need to know how conditional access does work. So the first step is we need a valid login from the user. So you cannot block logins with bad passwords with conditional access because the rule will not work when the password is wrong. So we need a valid username and password combination uh, for conditional access. 
then conditional access looks at the conditions of the rule and check which rule um, is valid because of the conditions. Then it looks at all valid rules which uh, access controls in the rules are. So there is no um, um, uh, uh, sometimes I miss an English word. Um, there is no order of the rules. All rules are checked if they are valid, if the conditions are met, and then um, you look at the access controls. A block wins always. So if you have two rules, one rule allow access, the other rule block access, the user is blocked. If you have in one rule, in one config, an include and an exclude, so if you include a group of user and you exclude one user, exclude wins. If you have two excludes, so you exclude a user and you exclude an operating system, this is not an AND, this is an OR. <laughs> if a rule says you need Windows, Windows is included, and browser is included, this rule is only valid for users that use a browser on Windows. And if you say you need MFA, and another rule say you need a compliant device, then the user need MFA and a compliant device. Uh, be careful with the includes and excludes in rules. A real working, uh, a real uh, um, configuration. The company has some users that should be able to access Office 365 from a Mac OS, but only from the internal network. Uh, and we excluded this group from all other uh, rules. So we make a rule and say this group, condition one is the device platform must include macOS. Condition two is the location exclude trusted network. Um, and then we say block access. So this means if the user uses a macOS and is not in the trusted network, he will get no access. Cool. The good thing is we always um, check the condition access policies um, with a colleague. So if I configure condition access, I document the rule, take the Excel and send it to my colleague and my colleague look at the rules and we do it vice versa. And a colleague sent me this configuration and I said, yeah, that works when the user is on a Mac OS. But if a user in, is in this group, and this group is excluded from uh, all other rules, and the user comes from a Windows device, he will not be affected from this rule because include macOS, and he can access the tenant without any multi-factor, without any limitations. So the solution is, um, I create rule one, I say this group of people excluded trusted network block access. And the second rule is this group of people exclude macOS block access. And then the user has to work from the trusted network with a macOS to access uh, condition access. So how to troubleshoot condition access? First, you need the Excel and you need to find gaps in this Excel. So every time something is excluded, you need a rule where this is included. 
Uh, if you have any blocks, wrong blocks, uh, the, the user will recognize the blocks very fast. But the problem in conditional access is that under some circumstances, user can access your tenant um, in a way you do not want them to access. Uh, trusted network is defined in named location, yes. There you can define uh, uh, a named location and you can say, I trust this named location. Um, when I enable conditional access and I remove user from the no conditional access group, I always check the uh, Azure AD sign-in logs. I refresh them because here you see if the access um, was successful or if a user has a failure. If you click on this uh, sign in in the in the conditional uh, in the Azure AD sign in logs, you see the basic information. You see the failure reason. You see the lo location of this user. You see the device information of this user. So here you can check if the device from which the user makes the login is compliant and or managed. And you see in conditional access which rule was success, which rule was a failure, and which rule was not applied. And if you click on the on the rule that was a failure, you see the rule, you see every point that is matched, and you see the problem why the rule is uh, was a failure. Um, in our implementations, we do not use the report only uh, um, switch. You, you can enable a policy, disable a policy, or set the policy on report only. We we do this most of the time. We, we do not use this. If you do this, um, there is only one um, way to see if the report only policy works or didn't work. This is in the sign in log in the tab report only. Here you see if it's if it worked or it doesn't work. Uh, a colleague of mine in, I, I think he's an MVP, he wrote an, an PowerShell script that looks at all sign in logs and um, put all report only failures into an, uh, a text file uh, because you, you cannot filter to uh, failures in the report only and so it doesn't really make sense. Sometimes I get the question, what is with the what if tool? Um, so you have in conditional access, a what if tool where you can test policies. Uh, to be honest, I use this not really because I look at the, the uh, Excel sheet and in the Excel sheet, you have the overview. Oops. Yeah. That was my presentation. I told you uh, a short overview of conditional access. I told you the good, the bad, and the ugly in conditional access. And I told you our best practices and learnings. You can reach me at this address. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. And now we have some time for other questions. Christian, I just want to say a massive thank you for that presentation. Thought it was fantastic. Um, lot to take from that, and I hope the, the the group got as much as I did from that. Um, a few good points there that, that you really raised. Um, and some something I'll take up internally with with our team. Um, that I think we could easily implement there. Um, around processes more more than anything. But I thought that was really really good. So thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Christian. It was really informative, actually. Really informative. I think we've got a question question from Dan. From Dan. He's got yeah. his hand up. 
Yeah, I was just going to ask. Um, I've been playing around with um, the app controls um, for conditional access policies and using Defender for cloud apps. Have you got any good sort of use cases for for sort of implementing that sort of, you know, sort of blocking people downloading specific documents and things like that? No, not really. We no. discuss we discuss this uh, every time. We are looking also for good use cases, for standard use cases to create a standard where you can go to the customer and say, use this use cases. We didn't find in reality any good use cases. Sorry. Okay, no problem. Cheers. But if you have some, please make a, a, a session here in the security user group and I will visit this and, and, and look at it. Okay, thank you. And, if we get some use cases, I, I will do the same. So uh, I think this is a part where we have to share all ideas about use cases. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you for the question. Is anyone else got any more questions for Christian? Um, feel free to come off your mic um, as well, rather than just text chat. Um, does Microsoft use a partner for governance like for? Virtual save point. Uh, Jamil, I do not know Forge or Forge Rock or save point, so I cannot answer your question, but I, I don't think so because otherwise I, I would know these two uh, uh, tools or partners. Yeah, I'm a bit on that um, question myself. Um... Do, do you mean to Microsoft internally use a partner for governance or for helping customers of Microsoft deploy governance? Um, um, Damian has a question to set up a container in a mobile device. Does it require physical access to device or can it be done remotely? It can be done remotely. So the user has to enroll the device that is normally done that he on, on Android and on iOS that you install the, the company portal and log on to the company portal and then your device is enrolled to Intune. Uh, the other possibility for mainly Apple is the device enrollment program where you um, put the, the device IT to Intune and this device is dedicated to your Intune environment and you can only log on from a company uh, um, log on to this device. Did I answer your question, Damien? Perfect. Yeah, Dean, uh, you can you can apps containerize by uh, mobile application management policies. But then you need um, the multi-factor authentication to secure the identity. So we want to avoid this um, for normal users. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah. You you were great uh, audience you were the and really you had the best remote audience i ever had in a remote session uh, and i i love the discussion and the questions and sorry that i, I take 15 minutes more than expected but no I, I think we have time enough and uh, it's not an event it's a user group and so it's okay i hope yeah, no, there wasn't a hard stop, Christian. So it's been brilliant and kind of great to see the questions come in, being answered yes. and relevant to the content as well. So, yeah, thanks for you for the answers and thanks for everyone who's attended for their questions. Um, really does make it a completely different session where it's collaborative. Yes, yes. yes. And that's what okay. we're trying to achieve. It, it, it's kind of a community and we want people to get involved, ask questions and, and all learn from each other. So massive yeah. thank you. Yeah. You have really a cool uh, community. I must say that it's I, I did a lot of community calls in the past last year and normally there are five to ten people 
and not so much like in your community and, and the questions were great. And thank you very much to be a part of this community. No, brilliant. Thanks for coming on. Really appreciate it. I know we've been talking about getting you on for a little while, so it's great to finally get you on for the first session this year. So yeah, thank you, Christian. Really appreciate it. And I think um, it was the best session this year, right? Of course, 100% <laughs> best session of the year. <laughs> well, so I just want to thank you again, Christian. Um, I'm I'm moving on here. This this, this slide's quite applicable. You know, feedback form. Um, we, we we can't. We we want to know how well we're doing. If things we can change. Um, you know, we okay. We we stand up here and 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 organise it. But we like feedback from you. It's you, you know, it's your community. And we, it's something that we want to grow for you as well as ourselves. So we're, we're open to feedback, whether good, bad, um, et cetera, and, and how we can improve um, th this user group and, and take things forward. Um, so the, the link's on the bottom there, or if you'd like to scan the QR code, and then you can fill in the Microsoft form. Um, and and we, we do look at that feedback. So uh, we really, really do appreciate it if, if you guys could pass that feedback back to us. And yeah, it's really just about growing the community. We're here to facilitate this community and build really the the voice of cloud security, really, more than anything, mainly in the Microsoft sense. Um, so yeah, that feedback would be fantastic. Good. So finally, kind of, yeah, just a huge thanks to everyone for joining us. Huge thanks to Christian again for coming on. Um, the recorded. We're going to stop the recording in a minute and then the recording will be uploaded onto YouTube in the next couple of days. Um, back onto the socials so you can follow us on our um, Twitter uh, at MSCSUG or obviously we've got LinkedIn as well and um, you've got the, the links at the bottom of various things. Also if you're interested in um doing your own session or we're open to kind of new speakers helping helping people out helping people kind of get to that first point of presenting in a community environment so we have a sessionized piece or reach out to myself or chris directly and we can have a conversation and even look to see whether there's somebody else who might want to team up to kind of do a joint talk as well um to help facilitate you taking that next step yeah, thank you. And don't don't forget the Microsoft Conditional Access Group in LinkedIn. Um, yes, there's a lot of information there. And ah, Stuart is now in the group. Congratulations. <laughs> well, we'll do, okay. Christine. We'll, uh, we'll we'll also share that via our social media uh, uh, as well, and um, when we send out um, the the uh, YouTube video links, etc. Um, and we'll also post it in there as well for you. So massive thank you once again, and thanks for everyone for for joining. Um, we're going to end the recording now, um, but we are open to stick around if any of you guys want to want to stick around and have a bit of a, a just a an informal chat. Anyone's got any questions, anything else you want to talk about? Doesn't have to necessarily be within the same subject um, area, mm -hmm. but. Yeah, just one final thing. We've got our next session that is scheduled. We just need to get the meetup event out. So that'll be out in the next couple of days as well. So that's in that's going to be on a Wednesday in February, I believe. Yeah, the 15th, if I remember correctly. Um the day yeah. after Valentine's. <laughs> it certainly is. Um so so no one's got an excuse not to turn up. Perfect. I will leave. Have a nice evening and thank you, and I will come back if you allow we of, of course, course we will christian thank you very okay. much bye fantastic session Cheers. good evening bye, good bye. Evening.